So, I'm Paul Dowman, and my company is OK Pro, and we build mostly, mostly media apps. Um, this is where you can find me on, on Twitter and, and the company as well. So we, this is what we do. We build web and mobile apps for clients. Um, and for the last year, last 12 months or so, we've been using Meteor for, um, for all new client projects. So we've done quite a few Meteor apps now. We like to, this is just some of the other things we like. Um, analytics, Agile, um, and of course automated testing, which all go together pretty well. So, how many people here have, I just want to kind of get a sense of what everyone does. Like, uh, I, I guess we've got mostly developers. How many, how, many not, how many people are not developers at all? Okay, <laughs> all developers, okay, awesome. And, and uh, how many people are experienced Cordova or PhoneGap developers? Okay, we've got a couple. And, and how many people have used Meteor? We've got a few, okay, awesome, cool, okay. Um, so I'm gonna get into a little bit about what makes Meteor different and special and then some other frameworks. Um, and we're gonna do a little bit of code and I'm gonna show you how we're gonna actually quickly whip up a, a Meteor app that uses Cordova. So we're going to build a we're going to build a get app. Oh, and I'm going to need a device at some point. I'm just going to grab that right now. Hey. So I'm going to do a little prayer to the live coding gods as well, make sure that all works. So, okay, so we're all, we're all developers. Um, we're, I think we're mostly web developers probably. Um, and that means we're we're using web tools, we're using JavaScript and HTML, but we're looking at, at everything as if it's a mobile app. So the planning for small screens, we are we are um, using animated screen transitions between apps. It's not like it's not like the old days where you just load a new page even though it happens to be um, a web app. It's it's really we are we are now treating the browser as a runtime. We have the opportunity now that we're building apps using JavaScript in the, right in the browser, we have the opportunity to do a lot more um, in terms of uh, in terms of actually feeling more like a native app should feel. Or, you know, 100% like a native app should feel. So we should be using touch as much as possible. So we're not using hover state, we're, we're pretty much designing our UI as if it's going to be touched and drag and swipe. And, you know, compare it to what the best install apps should look like. So. Um, this is just kind of general general um, development and what we expect now as web developers. We're not building websites, so we need a modern app framework. Um, I think there's, there's obviously a few contenders right now for what, what's, what people are using as a, as a modern app framework, but this is how Meteor is a little bit different from some of the others. So obviously it's an open source platform for building web and mobile apps in JavaScript. Um, and it's, it's really kind of meant to be uh, for the next generation of web apps. So a couple of years ago, it almost didn't even make sense to think of, of an app, of a, a framework that was 100% uh, in the browser. So there were, there were a lot of objections to that that are now slowly going away. Um, a few years ago, people were a lot more worried about SEO and the solutions weren't there. There were there was a lot of issues. And now I think we're, we're just kind of getting to the point where accepted that that's just how everything's going to be. And that's great for us as mobile developers because this translate nice, translates nicely to building apps using HTML and JavaScript uh, that are going to be installable on mobile device. So a Meteor app builds multiple targets. There's the server, there's the browser, and this was kind of how, it, how it's been for the last two years since the project started. Because this architecture was already there, they very easily, in, in like literally in like a few weeks as far as I can tell. Um, when version 0 0.9 came out, they, they said, you know what, we could really easily add Cordova support right into the framework. So they did. So now we've got iOS and Android as, as core, um, core platforms that you can build for, core targets. So all with one code base. This is a really interesting way of, of thinking of your apps. We've actually built client apps that compile to, and this is the default thing with Meteor, 
compile to uh, an Android, to an iOS app that's installable through the App Store, and works almost exactly the same in a browser. We'll, we'll actually just put up a quick example of that. There's no separate Cordova app to work with, so um, this is a really nice thing in development. You've just got your Meteor app. You're, there's a config file that you add, and of course, as you get more advanced, you can customize more and more things, and you can start putting in files that are gonna um, that are gonna replace some of your or you can obviously do splash screens and load screens and of course upcom files and all, all kinds of stuff. But uh, you don't have to you don't have to have multiple apps. So we we built it before um, before this was part of the media framework, we did build another um, Cordova media app and we had a Cordova project and Meteor project, and there was a, there were some third-party tools to hack them together. It, it worked pretty well, but it's a lot simpler now. So this is uh, th this is one of the things that I think we can actually improve on over native apps. So as as like web developers for mobile, we're always kind of using the native apps as as the bar in our mind uh, of how good the UI should be. But I, I think there's some areas where that's actually not even good enough. I think performance is, is one aspect, and that was, that was a really interesting talk before. A lot of stuff to keep in mind. So definitely we have some work to do to keep the performance as good as native apps. But there's a lot of things that native apps, or not, it's, it's, not, it's not a native versus web thing. It's just most app frameworks, including um, the usual tools that you use to build native apps, they don't necessarily support live updates. So, why, why do we have to pull to refresh all the time? And I'm, not, I'm really not a big fan of that. I like having the UI always reflect the state of the book, no matter what. So, and then the same goes for when you, when you, um, when you, make, uh, when you write data. So if you do something that's going to need to make a network, network request to the server, say posting a comment or whatever, you don't want to sit there and wait for it to be confirmed that it was sent. I mean, maybe there are times when you really want to be sure and you can't risk, it's so important that you can't risk um, you know, moving on with your, with your workflow and, and have it not complete. But I think most of the time you want to assume success, roll back if necessary. This is a lot of work to make all this happen if the framework doesn't take care of it for you. And, and general problems tend to get solved by general tools and I think all of these things eventually get pushed down into the, the framework layer, or they should. It's something you have to do in every app, you shouldn't have to do it. The framework should be avoided. So Meteor does, and Meteor is a uh, is full stack reactive app. So that means uh, data changes at, at the database will immediately and almost instantly be reflected in the UI of all the connected clients. So the way this works is you write declarative rules for what data gets published from the server to the client. And on the client, you subscribe to certain subsets of the data, and this is all declarative. And then, as you as you um, as you do things in your app locally, you're mostly just querying the local data store in your uh, in the client. So, in your browser, you you are actually just querying a local database, which, because you wrote certain declarative rules about what data is going to be synced to the client, the right data for you to query just happens to be there already. Um, that's, that's actually, you know, sometimes you have to think about, you have to do a little bit of work to think about what should be synced, but generally that works, that works really well. Um, and then the last part of that is that your view layer is automatically kept in sync. So if, if you are displaying a certain record from the database on the screen and it got changed in the database or by another client that went via the database and then uh, through a persistent WebSocket connection to your app, Meteor will automatically take care of updating the, the, the view layer for you. So if you're using a variable in a template that got changed in the database, it will just change in your template for you. Generally, you don't have to think about it. So this, this sounds kind of um, like a crazy thing to say because as web developers, for the last, I don't know, 10 years, REST was the thing that saved us from what was before, which was SOAP, which was, or just, you know, abuses of of uh, the HTTP transport protocol. But really, 
at its, at its core, this is still us sending out a request to the server, getting back a response, and then forgetting about it. So it's not data being pushed, it's not changes being pushed to us. So this is how, this is what Meteor does. So there's a, a WebSocket connection, always from the client to the server. Any changes that happen on the server get pushed in real time to the client. You don't have to care what this says. It's not something you need to even look at generally as a developer, but this is just an example of messages going over the DDP protocol. So you get a thing that says changed, and then it's the comments collection, and then the, the record with this ID had a new field added, for example, before the field was changed. So you get it's very efficient because you get very fine-grained changes being pushed down to you in real time. The data is always up to date in the client's cache, and then their the media framework on the client um, detects what was changed. It very efficiently changes. It just knows when that data is being used in the view. It just automatically updates things for you. It's not just uh, data that gets pushed over this DB WebSocket connection. It's actually code updates. So this kind of makes sense in, in the web world, but it's actually kind of mind-blowing for, for mobile. So the way this works is you, when you change the code in the server, um, a message will come over the DDP connection to the client and it'll say, new version of the code, time to reload yourself. And Meteor does a lot of work to make that reload happen transparently without disrupting the user experience. So it's not like, usually it's not like the entire page will, will reload. Um, in fact, even to the point of like you could be entering, you know, data in a form field and you won't necessarily be using it. Uh, a lot of the data that you sort of locally, in the, usually that data will leave in verbatim. So it's, it's almost totally transparent. So this actually works for mobile apps. And the way it works is um, the when you build a Cordova app with Meteor, it bundles the, the entire client app in, in what, into the app that you publish to the app store. And when I when I install that app, that on my device as a um, as a user installing it from the app store, I get the version that was published from the app store. <clears throat> then when the WebSocket connection connects to the server, it notices that an update has happened since this app was published to the app store. It's currently running with, with the version that it that it received from the app store. It gets the update. Uh, does the read does the refresh of the, of the local code, and, and then it, and it stores that in its local uh, stores that locally on the device. So from then on, when you when you start up your app, it will look it will use the, the version of the code that's on the device. Um, you can also set some settings to make sure that that doesn't happen. Um, you can cause that to only happen when the app reloads, for example. But we don't need to get into that details. So let's write some code. This is, I um, just want to do a time check. Uh, Amanda, what time? Uh, 8.26. Uh, uh, we can we go start? till around 9.10. Okay, yeah, we'll be, we'll be done before that. I just wanted to make sure I stay on track. So, um, and I, I'm just to keep it a little bit faster, I've got a cheat sheet with some code here. So I'm just going to just sort of save you all from my terrible type rules that are going to happen. So, we're going to create a new app. Let's make that bigger. So we're going to create an app. It's going to be called Demo. <clears throat> so we're going to CD Demo. Uh, and we're going to run it. Looks like. So 
So this is what a Meteor app looks like. We've got basically an HTML file, a JavaScript file, and a CSS file. I'm going to actually quickly take some CSS just to, just to save us from having to care about that. So here's, here's a basic Meteor app. Meteor app is, is JavaScript that runs both on the client and on the server. You can, you can tell certain, that's probably not big enough, you can tell certain chunks of it to run only on the client or only on the server if you want to. You can do that with an if statement or there's a file structure that you can use which is usually tidier, but for the purposes of this demo we'll just keep it all in one file. So <coughs> I'm going to go to this app in my browser. And this is basically the Hello World app that it generates. There's a button, and uh, that hooks up to a click event, and it just increments the counter. But we're going to actually just delete all that code, and we're going to kind of just take it from scratch, do a really simple thing that um, that will just demonstrate the basics, and then get a Cordova app. Going. So, here's another thing to notice. Any change I make is automatically, this is just a developer productivity thing when you're, when you're working in development, but the browser just refreshes itself always. The same thing happens when you push to the server, so you, you can make sure that no client is using old versions of the code. This is important with these type of apps because sometimes you just have a page only, it's just, it's just one page in the browser. People might be over the three pages. Right, have Gmail tabs running for forever. Yeah. Just on live reload, um, when you save a CSS or whatever pre posts file, does the browser refresh or just repaint? Uh, CSS actually handles even even better. So it doesn't, CSS, it just actually updates the CSS without even changing anything at all. Okay. So it, it like, uh, I don't know how it works, but it probably end up under the hood, just inserts a new CSS element that references the new script. Okay. So, so you don't the even change the DOM at all. Uh, for code re for code reloads, it might change the DOM, sure. reload some of the scripts, but it keeps a lot of your storage. So there are certain areas that if you just have JavaScript variable, you might lose it. But there's session storage, which goes to some effort to make sure that it keeps the data. Open. So I'm gonna what I'm gonna do now is I'm, I'm going to in my JavaScript file, I'm gonna create outside of those. So I'm going, to, I'm going to put this line, which is going to run on both the client and on the server. This is creating a new MongoDB collection. This should be a collection now. So what that does is actually create a collection called Pomodoros. By the way, the app that we're, that we're building is going to be a super simple version of an app that we use for our workshop. It's a Pomodoro timer app. Um, it's a team-based Pomodoro timer app, so you can see in real time, what everyone else's status is. They've got five minutes left in their current work uh, chunk. Then you know, not, you, you know, you can wait five minutes to vote. But um, now we haven't done anything to our uh, to our page yet. But I want to show you that we can actually start to start to use this. That's visible. So I can do things like. Insert. Is that readable? Yeah. It's too a little bit too low on the screen there. Um, let's, let's read that a little bit. Okay. So I'm I'm, uh, I'm trying out the Firefox developer edition, and it doesn't actually. This could be. Just be bigger. Okay. So. So what we're doing is we're saying insert a new Pomodoro. It's got a start date, which is a new date, and a goal, which is just a string. So let's let's do that insert. We just did this in the browser, inserted it to a local database. We didn't say make a REST API call to the server and, and do something on the server. We just inserted it into what's basically a MongoDB uh, 
uh, database were running in the browser, it syncs to the server. And if I had other tabs open, it would sync, or if other clients were using the same data, it would sync over to them as well. So we can, we can do things like find. So if I, had, if I have another tab, let's just open another one. And this is my second window here. And so now I can say pomodoros.find.fetch, which is going to load them. And look, they got my save object. So it's all happening, and it's hard to see the screen set up. But stretch that. There we go. So there's the object that came back. So there it is. Goal, write code, start date, that transparently got synced to my second window. Alright, so let's add, let's add some, um, let's add a template to show these things. So we're going to go into our, uh, into our HTML. Actually get rid of that. So you can see I've got a body tag and I've got a template. This template just has an, uh, an each loop that's iterating over this thing called all Pomodoros, which we haven't yet defined. So let's do that now. Um, oh, I forgot one step. So I want to also, in my body, I want to use this, I want to reference this Pomodoro thing. So this says here, render the template named Pomodoros list right here in the body. There's the template. Let's hook up some code to make this work. So I'm going to say in my JavaScript, in the client, I'm going to add a helper. And the helper is going to be called all Pomodoros. And it's going to return basically finding all. By the way, if there are any questions, anything's not clear, just shout it out. Because I'm just, I'm just kind of blasting through the basic stuff and then just so we can get to the, the, the Cordova integration part. May I ask a question yeah. about the templates? Yeah. Um, is that something like handlebars? Or yeah. Basic? Okay. It is. It is basically handlebars. It was handlebars until a little while ago. They kind of forked handlebars and called it space bars and changed it a little bit. But it essentially, essentially, it looks like handlebars. So every time you see these curly, double curly brackets, it means inside that there's going to be a um, special directive like each or maybe a property that's going to be referenced. So inside this each loop, we can just reference a property of our object. So if you, if you recall, when I inserted the, the object into the database, it had two fields. One was start date, one was goal. So we can just, we can just use them right like that. Um, let's see what we have in our browser. OK. There it is. That's the one that I inserted. The goal was write code, and there was a date. I didn't refresh anything. It's just which is there in both of the windows. So let's go on to our next step. Uh, oh yeah, we're adding a form. So I'm going to add this form. Let's say just underneath our, underneath our H1. There's a form called New Pomodoro. It's got one field, which is a text field. So that's going to be that's going to be the goal. So we entered one manually in the console, now we're just going to look it up to be able to do this right from the app. And now we need an event handler to be able to, uh, to, be able to use this. Basically when someone submits the form, we are going to, we're going to um, catch the event. See here, this says submit. That's the type of event. This is the selector for what we want to catch. That, that's a form with that ID. Uh, when, there's a, when there's a submit event on that form, this function gets called. We prevent default to stop the browser from actually doing what it wants to do, which is reload the whole page. So the browser will not submit the form. We insert this object, insert with two fields. We just create a new date, and we take the the value of the field named goal, and we just insert that. Okay. Any questions so far? I was blasting through this stuff. I want you to see the, the uh, 
uh, phone gap magic. Okay, so so I can well, I'll skip that one. Let's add a delete button. So basically, here in our in our um, in our HTML, I'm just going to inside the palm loader. Also here, I've got an li. It's going to be one of these for for each Pomodoro in the collection. Um, it's going to just because it's inside this each block, so I'm going to put a delete button, button name delete on each of them. And I need one more handler, so I'm going to say, go back to my JavaScript file, go to my event handlers, and on the click event, click event, uh, the selector is dot delete, which is, is anything with the class delete that, that I click on, this function will be called, and it's just going to, and I've got this, which is going to be the value of the object that I'm working with, it's just the string, uh, it's basically, it's just a thing like that, nothing magical, and I can just say pomodoros.remove, this dot, I can, uh, let's see if this is all working now. So, So I'll make a new task. Red code is, is the one I added from the console. Let's make another one. Debug code. And here's right, right there. Another. And it should have under. I have to scroll to see it. Delete that. Delete that. It works. It works. Cool. So this is this is that was pretty quick to get to a, 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 your basic kind of Read, 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 um, update, delete. So, and with, all with real time and, and multiple, uh, for multiple clients. So, let's push that a little bit further. Um, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go right to the, to the phone gap stuff, so that we have more time for questions. But here's an example of how, how easy it is to add accounts. For example, I would just, I would just do. Um, just add the accounts package, and then basically I will have full login functionality available, including Facebook, Twitter, and login, kind of all the components part of the framework. I'm going to skip over that, and I'm going to get right to the cool stuff. So I go to the command line, and I'm going to say, meet your ad platform iOS. It's a little weird that it's a different size. Oh, I shouldn't mess with it. Let's try that again. Be here. going to take a minute. Now, that was pretty fast. If, if I can do the same thing for Android. So if I go Meteor Ad Platform Android, um, if I didn't have Android, the Android tools installed, you can install them all. <coughs> or can you, if you've got them installed already on the machine, you can, you can, if you have the right environment variable set, it can take your global one. But they're really focused on developer productivity. So if, you, if, you, if you've never installed the Android tools, it will just do that right there for you. I'm going to restart my server. And oh, actually, I didn't need to start it there. I can go immediately on iOS. You can say media run iOS. Now, I'm going to have my iOS simulator. All this stuff from the last time. Click that. So, in a minute, I should see the iOS simulator starting up. Doing a little bit of work, installing all the plugins. If 
questions about that? Actually, uh, I'm using Windows OS, and uh, for that, I'm using Microsoft.io, yeah. building a video apps. Is there a way we can add platform iOS using Microsoft? Um, well, they're working on Windows support right now. It was like a, it, it recently started, and I, I'm pretty sure Windows support will be, will be pretty solid soon, but I don't know what's going to happen right now, especially when you're using through Metris. So I don't know. I, I don't know if that would work because it's not necessarily running locally. Yeah, I couldn't get there's, through the. Yeah. There's also Android. I mean, there's there's Android. So like, when you do get when they do get the Windows support finished and you're developing this community locally on your Windows machine, I would assume that Android would be able to work, but. I think it's, it's a major priority for them to make Windows work, so I think it will eventually work, but right now I don't know. Yeah. Are there any security concerns with having a, like, a local database? Like a local um, well, there could be if you publish all data, yeah. which you, you wouldn't do necessarily. I mean, you, you definitely wouldn't do that. Are um, there certain so, types of apps that you shouldn't write? So, so the answer is no. There, there are not, there's no inherent security problem there. You dec in fact, and I would say it's almost well, I'm not going to say it's more secure, but I, I like things that are declarative in general. You declaratively publish, you declaratively state what is going to be published. So it's really clear to you when you are, um, it's really clear when you're potentially doing the wrong thing. So on the server, you create a publish rule, and it says basically, it can take parameters, it can be based on the state of what the user interface is in. So uh, a really simple example would be a blog. So if you were writing a blog, and you were on a post um, when, when the client navigates to, say, the viewing a post route, it can subscribe at that moment only to that one post that it, that it cares about. It can subscribe to only the comments that relate to that post, for example. You could also subscribe to all data from the whole database if you want to, but you probably don't because you're going to have performance problems, potentially security problems. So there is a for ease of development, when you, when you create a new media app, there's a package installed called Insecure. And it's named Insecure because it's really obvious that you have to remove it. Um, and there's another package called Auto Publish. And together, those two packages let you really easily get started um, and be able to read and write any data that. So, right now, this app has the Insecure package and the Auto Publish package installed. And that's why I'm able to um, read and write any data. I didn't go set up rules, but you, very soon, or right away for me before I started with you about to remove those, and definitely before going into production, you would remove those, and you would set up the right publish. I mean, you should do it immediately, as soon as you understand how they work. Um, then you just set up the right rules, so you would not publish all the data. And you would set rules about who can, who can change what data. And because it's all declarative, it's just in one place, it's not spread through the I think our iOS simulator started up. There it is. And as you can see, it's got the same data. I can add a new one here from the iOS simulator. And if I go to my browser, I'm going to see that appear here as well. I didn't reload or anything, it's just there. So that is pretty cool. Now, let's go to the next. Let's go to the next level. So we're going to add, we're going to add the phone. And the phone has got some hardware that we want to use, namely a camera. So with Cordova, you can have. So for anybody that wants a little background on Cordova, you can have, um, you can have, you can have any kind of native code that you want. So you can write any native code, and then you provide a JavaScript interface so that your JavaScript app can use that native functionality. People publish um, uh, publish packages that encapsulate the commonly used things like camera, location, Facebook, whatever. It's all available as packages. If it's not, you can write it. So you can't quite see this yet. So I'm going to now. Media run iOS device, give it a port number. Next 
So in a minute, it's going to start up. Oh, it's going to, actually, it's going to start up Xcode, and then it's going to allow me to run this project on my phone. Let's give it a second for that to happen. Anybody have any questions while that's running? Yeah. So a lot of the communication here is based on uh, web sockets. Right. So when the Meteor app starts up, whether it be in, in the Cordova app on the phone or whether it be in the browser, yep. it makes one HTTP request, gets the main page, which is empty generally, but it's got stuff in the head, script tag, probably just one script tag because it minimizes and guides everything together. But I guess my question is, have you or anyone else done any work around scalability with um, you know, thousands of right. people connecting with Right, okay, so just for everyone else's benefit, it will, the next thing it will do is make a WebSocket connection, and then from then on, everything happens over that WebSocket connection. Right? It's right over the assets. So yeah, it's a good point. Because you've now got a persistent connection to the server for every client that has it open, that, pre that presents a scalability challenge that, that doesn't exist otherwise. It allows you to do real-time stuff, but of course, you gotta, it, it, adds, it adds another challenge, right? So the good news is that, um, in theory, it's generally horizontally scalable, for the most part. I'm not going to say that, that scaling is solved, because I think with any new, with anything new, scaling is usually uh, interesting. <laughs> um, and but they do, they they've done some really interesting technical stuff to help out with that. So, for example, I don't want to get too far into tangent, but MongoDB has something called Poplog, where every every database, or every uh, sorry, the right event that happens in your database. Every time the data is changed, like an update or a delete or an insert, that gets written out in real time to a log that slave servers, like other MongoDBs, can connect to to stay in sync. So multiple MongoDBs can be in sync. And this is how you scale MongoDB for a lot of read traffic. But the interesting thing with Meteor is that the Meteor servers themselves, the node process, also connect to this op log, and they get a real time feed of all the, of all the data that's changed. They know what queries their connected clients care about. And so when a change event comes in for a record that this particular client is currently using, currently published to this client, then, um, then Meteor knows that and it will, it will send that out. So now the scaling question comes, of course, because you've got all these things that's keeping track of, there's memory being used, there's number of open connections, et cetera, obviously that's a scalable job for sure. So, um, so you will run multiple media servers. This, this is the theory. I'm, I'm not going to say that we're going to see all this stuff yet. Um, they'll run multiple ones. They are all listening to the upload events, so they're not necessarily increasing any load on the database. In theory, depends on read versus write traffic. But anyway, that's kind of that's that's sort of how some of it works. I know that doesn't answer the question whether. No, I, mean, yeah, we're not, but I guess I guess another sort of corollary to that is, do you know if anyone is using it in a really big way? We we had I, I don't know anyone. Well, I do know of one person in, in our in our um, last meter uh, meetup. We had a, a live stream chat. And we were connected up with a couple other cities, and there was there was uh, there was somebody in one of the other cities that was saying they had four thousand current connections at any one time. Fairly heavy traffic. Uh, I thought that was pretty interesting. Yeah. Um, what sort of infrastructure do you support? I, I, they didn't really. I don't really. Know. So yeah, definitely scaling is going to be going to be a question. If anybody here remembers the early days of Rails and uh, Rails can't scale, it was a meme. So it will make it scale. Uh, it, it will. I'm, I'm not too worried about it. I think it's just that. You're going to have certainty to do different things. There was a magic bullet, sort of, for scaling Rails applications, which was use memcache in a lot of places. That's not going to solve your scale challenge with Meteor, but there will be other things that people learn. Right? So I want to just, just show you a couple more things before we get into any more questions. Uh, that should have started up Xcode. 3000. Oh, uh, did it give me an error? Sorry, I wasn't watching. Uh, oh, because my app's already running. Uh, sorry, right? Perhaps another meteor is running. Thank you, it was. 
<coughs> okay, this one. It's time to watch it. So this should start up next code with my my iOS project. Um, so all of this also works pretty much the same with Android. Started. Here comes Xcode. This is an iPhone 4, so not even a 4S. It's a very old, very old testing phone. Okay, now, here, let me just to get this on the screen quickly. There is a, come on. See, there's a loading screen that it just added by default. And there it is. <laughs> right. So you can see that, that we've got the same app running there. Um, oh, uh, problem connecting, so I see no data in it. Let me make sure my firewall is pretty well. Uh, this is always the fun thing about the live coins. Something like 2000. Kill it. Restart everything. Sorry. So we're not So. While this is starting up, the, the next thing I'm going to show you is I'm going to add a camera package. So there's, there's, a, there's a Cordova plugin that, that um, uses the camera. In a Meteor Cordova app, you can, you can add, you can directly add Cordova packages. It's Cordova plugins. And, and Meteor packages can wrap Cordova plugins as well to kind of make them a little bit more Meteor-like or to, um, to do to make them work the way you want. I've got some really stupid thing like my firewall is, uh, I don't know what it is. So this one, so the problem I'm having right now is that this is telling me there's no data. So I can see that it hasn't been able to connect to the, to the server properly. I'm going to go ahead anyway and I'm going to do the, I'm gonna do the camera demo. The cool thing was you, you would have seen it sync in, uh, you would have seen it sync into my browser as well. We're not going to get that happening, but I think we can, I think we can still show so I'm um, going to go add the camera. So here's how you add a new, uh, this, this is just adding a Meteor package. This one happens to be a package that uses a, uh, the Cordova camera plugin. Uh, I can directly add Cordova plugins, but this is a Meteor package that, that, that wraps the camera plugin. And makes it so the app, as you can see, is restarting itself. Notice that something got changed. Oh, it wants me to restart it now. Okay. 
Live coding is way more fun when it works, but it has its, it has its risks. Let's install plugins. It would also be better if my computer was faster. So when it says uh, running at local host, is that the server-side code running at the local host? Uh, where do you see that? Here, yep, yeah, that's when the server was running and this thing on port 3000 on my Mac. And this actually, oh, um, oh yeah, no, there's a, there's a proxy that's making that work. Oh, that might be, ah, no, that might be why. No, I need to go on here. Questions while it's loading yet again? Yes. Yeah, so um, I've actually worked with uh, apps that sync over uh, web sockets. Yeah. And there's usually usually an issue when the user gets into like a low um, a low bandwidth low network kind of area. So I was just wondering how does a um, feature handle stuff like when the app comes back online? Yeah. Uh, something is partially synced or just not synced at all. Well. I, I haven't noticed that, right. and I would say that it's actually sending a lot less data over because it's only sending changes when they happen. Right. You're never you're never reloading like sets of data. So when you navigate back some of the pages, not making like an API call and getting like a giant uh, the entire result set again. I've found that actually generally to be better, but but yeah, I mean I don't do a lot of testing on really low bandwidth situations. Like I generally assume. 3G or maybe a low quality 3G at least. Because right. if you could run a you drop message. Yes. Okay, here we go. Okay. Um, so I don't know if you can see that, but there's my there's my data, the same data, it's backwards because Dora Booth is smart enough to act like a mirror. But there we go. So the data the data is there. Now we're uh, we're got fun. I'm going to just quickly do something cool. Uh, this is totally contrived. I don't think you'd really want this in a Pomodoro app. But let's say, let's say that each time we add a new Pomodoro, we want to add, attach a photo with it. Maybe we can just prove that we did it. So um, I'm going to just take this image tag. So here's my Pomodoro. Here's my delete button. So here's my start date and goal. Let's say alongside with that, I'm going to add just an image tag with the source that takes the picture attribute, which doesn't yet work. But let's add one. Let's add, uh, let's add the code to make that work. So remember, we just added a package that, that uh, installs the Cordova camera plugin. So now instead of just simply pomodoros.insert, I'm going to replace that with the pomodoros.insert is still here. But this time it's wrapped inside a callback to the Meteor camera that get picture. So there's a plugin called Meteor Camera, which is it's it's very simple. It's almost just an example app, example plugin. But it uses the Cordova Camera, um, Cordova Camera um, plugin, and it just takes pictures. So let's go so you can see it. Uh, that's not going to work. But I'm going to click the. Let's also. I'm going to click on the start button. Oh, right. oh, I think it hadn't yet reloaded. Let's try that again. So it was just still in the middle of doing its um, hot code push because it hadn't yet received my change. The, the whole app didn't restart. It just, it just kind of uh, updated part of it. So I pushed my, my button. I pushed my, uh, my 
Start button here to, to insert a new task. And as you can see, the, the camera popped up, and this button says, there's the, there's the picture button. So I'm going to take a photo. Here we go. There's a little use, use photo or retake. So let's use that one. It's going to insert. There it is. Oh, and if I scroll up this one, you'll see it as well. It's there too. So that was, that was there in real time. And on, on the photo, there you can see it's, it's there in the picture. I can't see it very well, but. So there, that's the whole real time thing. So every client that's connected, my other window as well. Uh, anyway, you can see they all, they all have it. So that, that photo got saved, just, uh, it actually gave me a data um, URL. I just saved that as an attribute on, on the object. In this, in this device, it saved it to its local collection, which sent, which just, and then Meteor just took over, sent a, a message over DDP to the server, which is running on here, and it said, uh, just put an update to this record. It attached this data, which happens to be a photo. The server said, oh, I've got two other clients that are, that are using that same data. Send an update to both of them, and then they put it into the picture tag, and it worked. Pretty simple. Any questions? Yeah. What if we need to have uh, the REST API exposed for clients to yep. use? Yeah, so you can, for sure. Oh, you mean you want to expose one from your server? You can, yeah. Yeah. So uh, Meteor does, well, there's a, um, there's a package called Iron Router, which is the router package for Meteor, and that's both client and server side routing. So you can do that. So you can have the same routes that are client and server. You can define some routes that are on your server only. Those will be rest, rest, rest of the API. You can also obviously consume REST APIs. I mean, I, I did say that you probably don't want to do that for most of what you're doing. You're going to be mostly reading and writing local data, but there's um, there are times when you when you need to use other APIs, of course. Like every app you have to actually does that. You can do that either from the server or from the client. And in fact, it uses the same API on both. So there's Meteor has an API called you just do HTTP <coughs> get. If you're on the client, um, it's going to use it's going to under it's going to use AJAX underneath to take care of course and all that kind of stuff for you. If you're if it's if that same code is running on the server, which the same code can run in both places. So when that same code runs on the server, it'll use the node uh, HTTP uh, uh, get library, hide some of the complexity of that for you as well, because Meteor allows you to it uses fibers. So that's you kind of code in a more procedural, synchronous looking style. Um, so yeah. There, there's actually, I, I guess it's a loophole because, but it, but it seems to be not a problem right now until people start. Maybe if people start abusing it, it'll be a problem. But anyway, I'll get to that in a sec. So, the the official rule is, if it's um, you, you can't update your code in, in an iOS app, but you can update the contents of a web view. And so, in the case of the Cordova app, the whole thing is in the web view. So it's not a problem. I think if people started using web views to totally change the way the app worked, the guidelines would probably get rewritten or start getting enforced differently or whatever, but right now it's not a problem. I don't think that's a risk to, well, I mean, it's a risk to our code push on iOS, but it's not a risk to the, the whole architecture I don't think would change. They would just say, fine, no hard code push on iOS, but, but for now it's fine. What about if you add a new part of the package with that? So no, then you can't hot code push that. Then you have to, if you do anything that's going to use the, the Cordova APIs or the plugin or whatever, that has to be a push a new version of the app. Or you have to release a new version of the app. Yeah. How does hot push behave if you actually uh, start it up in the offline mode? If you start it, it works. Yeah. So, so will it, will it if I download an app, so if I, if I publish this app that I just made here to the app store, 
and then you go and install it on your phone while you're connected, but never run it, then disconnect from the network, go on the subway, turn off your Wi-Fi, whatever, um, and then start up the app, it will work, and it will it will have the, the all the code that was, the, the whole client part of the app will be there and, and running. It will try to make its data connection. After it starts up, it will try to make its data connection. And that's actually what we saw here. When I started this up the first time, it loaded, but there were no, there was no data. So I didn't see any of my Pomodoros that I had inserted. So I knew right away that it just had failed to connect to the server somehow. I didn't put it in this. What I meant is that if you, if you live updated your app, mm -hmm. and then you turn it off, and then restart it in the offline mode. Yeah, so at first, Will you will you get the updated version? We'll get the updated version. Yes. Mm -hmm. No, like when it starts, it first goes to the uh, saved version in on the storage on the device, and it tries to run that. Where does it store it? Uh, wherever the app storage is, I guess. So, like oh. on an Android device, under some folder on your on your uh, USB device. I mean, on your whatever you call it, <laughs> on the storage that. The same place, the same way the app stores data. So for, if you were to go and clear data for an app, then that would actually reset it back to its original version that was from the store. How does that work in terms of, uh, of like disrupting user flow? So if I'm a user using the app and I'm in the middle of an app and I'm doing a live yeah. um, update, how does that affect me? On mobile, um, I don't know why, but on mobile it affects more than in the browser. Usually the browser you can barely notice. I mean, sometimes you do notice, right? But on mobile it's, it seems to be a more obvious experience. And there is a, a package that you add which says only only refresh when the app restarts. So you can, you can cause it to not do a hot code update until the app is closed and restarted so it doesn't interrupt your phone. And you can do that. Is that something you can do? Like specific to mobile and say, okay, only when yeah, you that only the that's actually only on the app. Right. Yeah, exactly. You have to be careful because if you do that, because your schema might be different, right? So the new version that you assume everyone is using now might have new fields in the database and the right? So you have to be careful. The nice thing about hot code push is that you never have your schema for your data out of date. Could happen in that case, you just have to be more careful. And oh, and you can also uh, mention that in the in the Cordova app, you can you saw that I had those his server and um, and his client blocks in here. So here I've got if if meteor his client, if meteor dot his server run this code. Uh, there's another one you can use if meteor dot his Cordova. So you can. Change the UI, for example, or behave slightly differently. If you've got the same app that people are accessing through the web browser and through the mobile phone, you can make it behave differently. Questions? Yeah. Uh, just curious. So you added a package for Cordova for the camera, uh, and it worked fine on your phone. Yeah. Does it also behave the same way in the browser? Yeah. Check it out. Watch this. So if I go, let's delete all these ones. Just so you can see it, or I'll just close that so I have more room. Uh, if I make a new one, waiting for camera permissions, would you like to share this camera? Yes. Hello, take a photo. Use photo, take me a photo. Looks good. There it is. <laughs> Pretty cool. And it's on here now. So I, I love the idea of, of writing apps that whether it's mobile, whether it's whether it's in the browser, it just it's just one app and it works exactly the same. I mean, I think uh, you only want to like that allows you. You don't have to make a decision like is this a mobile app or is this a web app, right? It's a cloud app with like any number of clients. If I want it to be distributed through the app store for whatever reason, because maybe that's the, you know type of consumer app that people want to have that way I can. If I wanted the same app to be available, to be linked by a URL that people are going to share on Twitter, email, you know, whatever, it just works. So you, you don't have to make these trade-offs. Obviously you have to make some other trade-offs, perhaps you always do in everything, but I think that the goal of 
the goal of being able to write an app that just works on every device the same way is, I think that's the goal. That's what I want. Is, uh, is Meteor able to work with other frameworks, such as Ember.js or AngularJS or something like that? Um, I actually can't think why you want to. I mean, <laughs> I think yes. I, I've never tried this, so I know I know people do this kind of stuff. Oh, actually, here's a reason why you might want to. Let's say you want to use Ionic. That's something I didn't touch on. So, um, Ionic is not Ionic does not work. Um, there are there are projects. Well, I mean, I guess there are projects that make Ionic work. You take the CSS, but you know, Ionic is an Angular thing. So, for example, you don't you don't get full use of something. So I mean that might be a people do it. Um, yeah, I, mean, I just should mention a couple of things. Like it's really new. There's a couple of bugs. Nine patch images on Android don't work for some reason. There's some kind of work around probably, but that's it. So yeah, so people do things to make other frameworks work with it. Oh, and actually Meteor is very modular. So it's it, it is a framework that packages a whole lot of stuff together, but those are they are all separate pieces under the hood. They're all published on so you can use only the rendering engine. People are using, say, React to render with, uh, to render, um, people are using, like, say, the Meteor backend with React. So I guess that's the kind of thing you're talking about, but I think there's so much benefit to just using one framework, even if it's, even if you, like, I think you'd have to really hate one part of it to, to want to, to want to switch it for React. Well, it's just, you know, like there are lots of really powerful things in Angular, for example, that might be really cool yeah. um, coupled with this data synchronization for it. Yeah, right? totally. So you could. And in fact, the DDP protocol has clients for um, like every language. So Java, native iOS, like Objective C clients, there's Android clients, there's like Ruby clients, everything. You can actually write a native app as well that would that would connect to the same backend and use the same GDP. But you're gonna have to do everything. Like once you've got the data, then you have to use some other framework. Actually, just to add a point, the reversal for that of that is also true. But uh, there's a database framework called Swarm, which provides the real-time aspect, and then you can use it with whatever front end framework you want to use. So you can still get the same syncing as me here, but you saying the other very yeah. cool. And is it like a relational database or a non-relational database? Uh, it's a non-relational. Okay. Cool. Thanks for that. Yeah. Oh, and one more question. Where can you deploy something like this? Like, do you need a VPS, or is any node server going to be sufficient to, to deploy? Yeah. On? Any place you can deploy uh, a node app will work. Okay. Uh, Meteor. They're actually working on. They 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 have a very simple um, deployment. You can actually just type Meteor deploy app name for any app that you created and it will just deploy right there to their server with no other configuration necessary. So so you can instantly deploy to their infrastructure right now. It's not super robust and it's not something you probably want to use for a production app. It's great for fun for playing around. They are actively working on um, their solution to that. They're, it's, it's going to be the full, basically the full end to end thing, including the infrastructure. It's not right to but I know they're I know they're working hard on it. Well, thanks. I'm sure their their infrastructure would be awesome. At the moment, we use Heroku. Okay. So yeah, anything that it's it can be bundled just as a node.